Hey folks, in this video, we're looking at empirical formulas and how we can get those to become molecular formulas. Um, all these formulas, all these formulas, let's get going. I would like you to be able to distinguish between empirical formulas and molecular formulas, something we've already talked about. I would like you to be able to determine molecular formulas if you have an empirical formula and the molar mass. And I would like you to be able to determine mass percent composition. And I would like you to be able to determine the mass percent composition of different compounds. And oh my gosh, I would like you to be able to use mass percent composition to determine empirical formulas. And in a mix-up of goal number two and goal number five, use mass percent composition and molar mass to get molecular formulas. That seems like a lot, so let's make moves on that. New vocab is going to be mass percent composition. So empirical formulas versus molecular formulas, we talked about this, but a molecular formula tells you what's really happening. It describes the full formula of a molecule counting for every atom. So what we see here is hexane, C6H12, and we can see all of those atoms, um, how they are connected, pretty great stuff. Cyclohexane, my example over here, my formula, C6H12. On the other hand, an empirical formula is going to be a simplified or reduced version of our molecular formula. We will take the ratio between elements in our molecular formula and make that as small as possible. So instead of a 6 to 12 ratio, we're going to reduce that and make these subscripts smaller numbers. Um, instead of this C6H12, I'm going to reduce this from a 6 to 12 ratio to a 1 to 2 or CH2. And as we can see, the empirical formula for cyclohexane does not really give us a full picture of what's going on with that molecule. However, sometimes we only get empirical formulas. If we are, you know, just to clarify here, I divided all my subscripts by 6. Um, C6 became C1, H12 became H2. So we would use an empirical formula, just to talk about that for another hot second, if you had a new chemical and you sent that out for analysis, you would only get back an empirical formula. There's some times where you're only going to get an empirical formula. They're generally not as useful, though. Anywho, if we have the empirical formula and the molar mass for a compound, we can come up with the molecular formula. There's a few quick ways to do that, or a few simple steps. First thing we need to do is get the mass of the empirical formula. That's going to be pretty easy to do because empirical formulas are short and reduced. Um, so if we have an empirical formula of C2, H5, and L, I can come up with the molar mass of this guy, standard molar mass procedure. Oh, I'm sorry. So if we have this empirical formula of C2H5NO and a molar mass of 236.32 grams per mole, we can figure out, using these two things, what the molar molecular formula, molar molecular, molecular formula will be. Um, and so the first thing I'll do is get the empiric mass of my empirical formula. So I can just do that by figuring out what each element contributes overall and adding those bad boys up to get the mass of my empirical formula. Next, I'm going to divide the molar mass by the mass of the empirical formula. So I have my molar mass, um, and I'll divide that. So 236.32 yeah, divided by 59.08, and that's going to give me approximately 4. Now, all I have to do is multiply this number by the subscript in my empirical formula. So I'm going to look at that C2, H5, and O, and I'll multiply each one of those subscripts by 4. That's going to be 2 times 4 for carbon, 5 times 4 for hydrogen, and for nitrogen and oxygen, since they each are lacking a subscript, we'll assume that their subscript is 1, so it'll be 1 times 4. And this is going to give me my, blah, give me my molecular formula, a little bit of alliteration there, of C8, H20, N4, O4. Cool beans! Well, let's look at another example. Um, so, first thing we want to do is get the mass of our empirical formula, and let's look at another empirical formula and a really honking big molar mass. But, it doesn't matter, we're going to follow the same procedure. We'll get the mass of my empirical formula. Same thing, I know there's three hydrogens, okay, there's two fluorines, alright, there's five chlorines. Great, I got the mass for each of those and add them all up to get my mass of the empirical formula. I'll divide my molar mass by the mass of the empirical formula again, and that's going to give me approximately 9. We should always round this number to a whole number. Um, and lastly, I'll take this number from step 2 and multiply it by all my subscripts. So my carbon is going to become, oh look, this little 9 got, got knocked down below there. <laughs> Either way, um, I'll do 5 times 9 for carbon, 3 times 9 for hydrogen, 2 times 9 for fluorine, and 5 times 9 for chlorine, which gives me C45, H27, F18, Cl45, cool beans, my molecular formula. Um, that's a pretty big honking molecular formula, in fact. But anyway, let's talk about weaponized cats. 
Did you know that back in the time, people wanted to put cats and, like, attach missiles to their backs? Yep, there's, like, multiple ancient manuscripts that show this. And contemporarily, people want to make weaponized cat missiles that are much larger. Look how big that cat is. I don't know how they made that cat so big. Anywho, if we have this thing called percent mass composition, this is also useful with our molecular formulas and empirical formulas. So, the mass percent composition measures what percent of the mass of a compound comes from each of the different elements it's composed of. And it's useful as a technique for studying unknown pure substances. You can have an unknown dude send it out to a laboratory and they'll analyze it and figure out how much of the mass that you send them comes from individual elements. Um, it's used by scientists, as I said, to characterize new and unknown compounds. So an example would be glucose. If I wanted to get the percent composition, I know that it is 40% carbon by mass, 6.7% hydrogen by mass, and 53.3% hydrogen mass. So anytime I have a sample of glucose, if I pick up some nice little sugar crystals, I know that 40% of the mass in my hand comes from carbon, 6.7% of the mass in my hand comes from hydrogen, and 53.3% of the mass in my hand comes from oxygen. Every glucose will be like this. So if you've got 100 grams of glucose, that means that You've got 40 grams of carbon, 6.7 grams of hydrogen, and 53.3 grams of oxygen, because 40% of 100 is 40. Um, nifty, nifty. So these things are useful, and what we can do if we want to determine percent composition is, it's pretty simple, we're going to determine the molar mass of our compound. So cool beans, let's do this dude, and our molar mass would be 114.13. And then we're going to, for each element, multiply the number of atoms in the compound to get the atomic weight or by the atomic weight, which we pretty much always have to do to get our molar mass. So yeah, it's generally a good idea to record your work um, so that you don't have to do this multiple times. So here, I just take the four carbons, the eight hydrogens, the, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, the three nitrogens and the one oxygen, and I know that my oxygen contributes 16 grams to this total molar mass. Now what I'm going to do is divide the mass for each element by the molar mass, multiply it by 100, and that gives me the percent composition. So I'll start with my carbon, and I'll do 48.08 divided by that molar mass times 100. That tells me that for this compound, 42.1% of its mass comes from carbon. I can do the same thing for hydrogen, and this tells me that sorry, 7.1% of the mass of this compound is hydrogen. And I can do it for the other dudes too. I know that 36.8% of the mass is nitrogen and 14.0% of the mass is oxygen. Super sweet. That's not too spicy. Um, let's do a practice with one more dude. This guy's kind of gnarly, but same process. So let's go through it together. Um, we're going to get the molar mass. And so I'm just going to show my work and say, all right, here are the masses for each one of my compounds or elements, here's how many there are, and this is what it's going to weigh total. So I've got all of these dudes total, not a lot of sulfur in there, not a lot of sulfur. But anyway, I can add all these numbers up um, to get the molar mass, and now I can divide each of these numbers by the molar mass, or I'm sorry, I already did step two, so we can skip over that. But I can divide each of these numbers by the molar mass and multiply it by 100 to get the percent composition for each of these elements. So I'll go through that. I know that 52.72% of the mass is carbon. I've taken my mass from the carbons and divided it by that total molar mass. And I can do this for all my other elements. I'll just put their percentages up a yonder to keep things easy. All oh, those went in a weird order. Anywho, um, yeah, we got 15.61% nitrogen, 21.67% oxygen, and Lastly, just so we're running out of space, we'll do our sulfur or up here. We've got 3.299% sulfur. Cool. Um, so that's really not too spicy. If you know how to get a molar mass, then it's really very simple to determine the percent composition by mass. Um, cool. Well, if we want to calculate our empirical formula using percent mass composition, that's a little, little bit spicier. <laughs> Let's say we have an unknown compound. It's made of 24.02% carbon and 75.9% fluorine. What's the empirical formula of this compound? Well, we can figure it out by following these steps. First, we want to change these percentages into grams. And we can skip, skip this step if we're given masses to start with, but frequently we'll be given percentages. So I'm just going to take that percent sign and change it into grams. Um, yeah, easy peasy, first step. Very easy peasy. Next, I'm going to convert those masses into moles using atomic weights from the periodic table. We're pretty well versed in this, so that's not too spicy. We'll just use, use those atomic weights as conversion factors. And now we know how many moles of each thing there are. 
Um, and then the last thing I'm going to do, I guess that's not the last thing. One of the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide each of these number of moles by the smallest number of moles. So carbon has the least number of moles, so I'll divide each of these by two. Um, so I'll take my two moles of carbon, divide that by two, and get one carbon. I will take my four moles of fluorine, divide that by two to get two fluorine. What I've got now is a ratio between these two elements. Um, and so the last step I'm going to need to do, well, actually, I don't need to do it here. But the last step I might need to do is multiply all of these numbers that I got out of step three by an integer to turn them into whole numbers. We'll see an example with that in a little bit. But since these are both whole numbers now, one and two, I'm done. And I have my empirical formula of CF2. Great. One carbon, two fluorines. Um, that's not too spicy. Let's look at a, another problem. Um, and we're going to show the long way to get from percent composition to a molecular formula. But we're going to start the same way. We need to get our empirical formula from our percent composition. Um, so let's see. We've got a compound. It's got this percentages. And we also have our molar mass. So we have our percent composition, our molar mass. We're going to get to molecular formula with these. And we're going to follow the same steps that you already have seen, just putting them together. So step one, let's turn percent composition to empirical formula. We'll change those percentages to grams. We'll convert all of those grams into moles using our atomic weights on the periodic table. Great. We're going to see which one of these is smallest. And we're going to divide all these other numbers by the one that is smallest. So 2.94 is the smallest number of moles. So we'll do 3.92 divided by 2.94 to give 1.33 oxygen. We'll do the same thing for hydrogen. That gives us 1.99 hydrogen. If you are within a tenth of a whole number, you can probably go ahead and round up. Um, and we'll divide 2.94 by 2.94 to get one oxygen. So now we do need to do that last step because we don't have all whole numbers here. This is a whole integer number. This is a whole integer number, but this guy isn't. So I'm going to multiply these by integers to figure out when, um, how to, yeah, let me use my words. I will multiply all these numbers by the same integer in order to make them all whole numbers. I can see if I multiply all these by 2, that's not going to make this a whole number. But if I multiply everybody by 3, this will become a nice happy 4. Oh, yeah, see 2? That doesn't work. Um, so I'm just going to try next 3. Um, so if I multiply everything by 3, that's going to give me 4 carbons, 6 hydrogens, and 3 oxygens. Those are all, all nice whole numbers, and so I am happy with that. My empirical formula is C4H6O3. Cool beans. We got our empirical formula. But now we need to get the molecular formula. Well, we know how to do that. We're going to use our empirical formula and that molar mass. So we got our empirical formula. Boom. And that's pretty easy to come up with the mass. We already knew our molar mass. That was on the previous slide of 612.54. So we'll do 612.54 divided by 102.09. That comes out to 6. And so now I know to multiply these subscripts in here all by 6. So this is going to become C24H3609. Um, wait a tick. That should be 018. Uh, let's fix that. Okay, great. So that's our final answer, and that's our final problem. I hope you got all of that. We've got empirical formulas, molecular formulas, the new concept of percent mass composition, and I hope you understand how all of those are related and how we can use those to find each other. Anywho, ta-ta. Have a great rest of your life.